Right, for an organism to grow to any substantial size, it will need to make more cells. The cells can't just get bigger and bigger. You need to make more of them to be a proper multicellular organism. Now remember, you started out as just one single cell called a zygote. And this cell divided over and over and over again to make the trillions of cells that now make up you. However, it's not all just about growth because even when you stop growing, you still need to make more cells. You've got to replace the thousands of cells that you lose every second of your life. Also, you've got to remember that cells can only come from pre-existing cells. So really, cell replication is a massively important topic to understand in biology. In 2013, Eva Bianchoni in Italy estimated that there are 37.2 trillion cells in an average human body. Now that is a huge amount of cells and a lot of cell division considering you started off as just one individual cell. And like I said, it's not at all about this growth of cells, it's the fact that even when you finish growing, you've got to replace all these other cells. You replace your entire stomach lining every five days. About 2 million red blood cells are produced every second in your body. 2 million every second. And if you're a man, you produce about 1,500 sperm every second. So cell replication, really, really important to understand. Now, when cells divide, you don't want to put half the DNA into one of the cells and the other half into the other. Because then, if the cells keep dividing like that, you're just going to get half the DNA each time going into each of the new cells. And before long, there'll be hardly any DNA left. Therefore, just before a cell divides and splits and forms two cells, it's going to have to copy its entire DNA so that one copy can go in one cell and the other copy can go in the other cell. Now the DNA is normally a really jumbled mess of chromatin. So before the cell divides, this DNA must become more organized and easier to move around for cell division. And it forms structures called chromosomes. To form a chromosome, the DNA molecule winds around proteins called histones to form nucleosomes. Then they supercoil to form these, this dense chromosome structure. Now most people get this bit wrong. Uh, if you Google chromosome, you'll find lots and lots of pictures of this typical sort of X shape. But actually what you're looking at there when you see that sort of X shape isn't a single chromosome. That is a double chromosome. That's what it looks like once it has been replicated, once all the DNA is copied and it's just about to divide. And you, you can split that double chromosome, those, that double copy there, into two what we call chromatids. And they're joined in the middle by something called a centromere. So if you take this chromosome, for example, this is chromosome number six uh, in a human, and this is what it would look like uh, in a normal cell, okay? Not that X shape, just a single chromosome like that, linear chromosome. But before that cell divides, to make sure that the new cells can get one copy each, it's gonna have to double, it's gonna have to become this double chromosome with two sister chromatids joined in the middle there by a centromere. So to copy a chromosome like this, you're gonna to have to do a process called DNA replication, and that's what this video is all about. So before we think about replicating DNA, we should probably just recap a couple of the key points about its structure. Remember, it's a polymer of nucleotides. They are joined together by phosphodiester bonds. It's a double-stranded molecule. And remember, the strands are anti-parallel, so one, while one goes in one direction, the other one goes in the opposite direction. The bases pair up uh, in complementary base pairing. A's always goes with T's and C's always go with G's. And they are joined together, these bases, down the middle by hydrogen bonds. Two hydrogen bonds between the A and the T and three between the C and the G. And the strands run in a three prime to five prime direction. Now the first stage of DNA replication is to unwind and unzip the two strands of DNA. This is done by an enzyme. Now there's lots of enzymes involved in DNA replication, so be careful of that, and we're gonna recap them all at the end of this video. But the first enzyme we're gonna talk about here is something called DNA helicase. And it will just come along and it will break those hydrogen bonds and cause the molecule to unzip down the middle. 
that. And what you end up with, therefore, is the two separate strands coming apart. Uh, and these form what we call templates, which is where the new DNA strands are going to form. Free nucleotides will be able to come in and match up by complementary base pairing. So free C uh, nucleotides will come in and match with the Gs, and free As will come in with the Ts, etc., to form two complementary uh, strands on each of the template strands. However, if only it was that simple, because actually we've got a little bit of a problem here, which is that uh, DNA, new DNA, can only be laid down in this way in a five prime to three prime direction, referring to this strand, uh, new strand itself. It can only go in a five prime to three prime direction. Now that's fine on one of the strands, which goes in, uh, which will. Um, work in that direction, which is what we call the leading strand. But the other strand is going in the opposite way, uh, because remember they are anti-parallel, and therefore you can't just m put in the bases in a nice easy order. So, this is what happens in detail. This is what we call a replication fork, uh, where the two strands are being peeled apart and replication is moving along. The strand that starts three prime, as you can see here, is what we call the leading strand. This means that on this strand, you can actually lay down the new DNA in a five prime to three prime direction uh, very easily. And it just moves along from one end, uh, following the replication fork as it goes. And so this is um, done by another enzyme called DNA polymerase three. Here it goes, it just moves along and it puts in the complementary strand. It's very, very simple. So that is the leading strand of DNA. Now, as I said, this gets a little bit more complicated because on the lagging strand, uh, if we want to lay it in a five prime to three prime direction, it would be going in the opposite direction to helicase and the replication fork. What actually happens here is that we have to do it in small little sections and it leapfrogs its way along the strand. An enzyme, first of all, called RNA primase follows the helicase as it unzips the double helix. Uh, the RNA primase leaves small sections of RNA called RNA primers. The RNA primers show where the DNA polymerase should start. The DNA polymerase 3 can then go along and attach to the RNA primers and replicate in the direction that they work, which is the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And once they've done that section, they detach and leapfrog to the next primer following the helicase. These new strands of DNA are what we call Okazaki fragments. And the next job is to remove these RNA primers. And we use a different type of DNA polymerase for this one. This one's called DNA polymerase 1. And that goes along and replaces all the primers. So once we've got rid of the primers and we've got our Okazaki fragments, the last job to do is to just go along and stitch all those bits of DNA together, which is done with a final enzyme called DNA ligase, which uses ATP. And then that is the lagging strand complete. Now this doesn't just happen at one end of the chromosome and work its way along to the other end of the chromosome, that'd be a bit too slow. It actually happens throughout the molecule in various areas, which we call replication bubbles. Um, uh, the forks work in opposite directions, and once it happens in all the different bubbles, it will just join up and the whole chromosome will be replicated. The two new strands wind up once they're done to form this double helix shape. And this is what we call semi-conservative replication. So what we've done here is we started with a molecule of DNA, and there is actually one of the original strands of that DNA in the two, each of the two new molecules of DNA. Um, this is um, why it's called semi-conservative, because half of the DNA is conserved uh, into each of the new molecules, semi-conservative replication. Um, this is the way it happens in eukaryotes, and pretty much the same in prokaryotes as well. Now, the fact that it was semi-conservative replication was worked out by some very clever experiments done by Messelson and Stahl, which is something you can look up for some extension material there. Now, this doesn't work perfectly every single time. DNA replication makes a mistake about one in every 10 billion nucleotides. However, DNA polymerases can actually proofread the DNA and repair these mistakes as it goes along. Even when mistakes still occur, another process that occurs after DNA synthesis called mismatch repair can fix them. So the cell has this inbuilt mechanism to stop errors occurring. Occasionally though, errors can still happen and that is when you get a mutation. Now here's a table summarizing the major 
molecules and enzymes involved in this whole process. And I suggest you copy and complete this table. So in summary, just to go through the process of DNA replication, it starts off by DNA helicase unzipping and unwinding the double helix uh, by breaking the hydrogen bonds between the base pairs. On the leading strand, DNA polymerase 3 makes a complementary strand running from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. On the lagging strand, you need RNA primase to follow the helicase and leave RNA primers behind. Then DNA polymerase 3 can attach to these primers and make the Okazaki fragments and they leapfrog backwards as it goes following helicase. DNA polymerase 1 then replaces the RNA primers with DNA. And finally, DNA ligase moves along, attaching all the DNA on the lagging strand together.